don't see Lauren yet. Paul yes, and Pamela. Paul and Pamela um, may or may not make it today. Yeah, no, I know. So but we I should have Lauren. Lauren yet. Okay, well, that's going to be interesting. Um, okay, let's go. Yes? Yeah, he's going. Uh, yeah. We're recording, yes. Okay. Staying in the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call the April 12th, 2023 G Governance Organization and Legislation Committee uh, to order. Uh, to this is a virtual meeting and pursuant to state law, which extends the remote meeting provisions pertaining to the open meeting law. This meeting will be held by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by a Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members or of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So to make, ah, welcome Lauren. To make sure we, we can all hear and be heard, I'm gonna call uh, on uh, each member of the committee to state whether they're present. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. And Pat DeAngelis, I'm present. And I welcome Lauren Goldberg. Oh, Lynn, oh, Lynn, Lynn Griesmer. Lynn. I'm sorry, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lauren. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You sent us a load of trouble. Uh, apparently. <laughs> I try to stay out of trouble and not get into it. Well, we're very interested in um, getting any update from you about the public di dialogue issue and the civility issue. And then I'm sure we have questions for you um, if that feels comfortable to, for you to begin. Also, we ha may have a couple of questions about the proposed flag policy, uh, which Understood. I think sent you as well. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I'm happy to answer if there is an answer. Um, I, I just want to say one thing. I'm getting ready for a medical procedure, and I may have to drift away from the meeting momentarily, off and on through the meeting. I don't know. But Jennifer will take over then as chair. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Oh, sorry. You guys probably don't want to hear my dogs barking. Um, <laughs> it's what happens when you work from not the office. No. Yeah. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I have had many opportunities over the past few weeks to discuss this uh, exciting Barron case, which I just call Southboro because it's easier. Um, essentially, we haven't moved much from what our initial kind of thoughts were on this, in that um, we don't think that exercise by a chair of any meeting of some authority as to conduct of the meeting necessarily is inconsistent with Southboro. However, um, what I think Southboro has really put a fine point on is that when, when, um, when we're looking at orderly conduct, it's not just unpleasant conduct, it's more than that, it's disruptive conduct. So if the meeting itself is being disrupted because uh, a person won't stop talking when they're asked to stop talking or they won't, um, you know, back up if they're asked to back up, if they're in someone's personal space or they, um, you know, they continue to scream after they've been seated. Those are the types of things that <laughs> will still be able to be regulated. Um, in, in addition, you know, I think there can be some agreement um, as to, uh, I don't want to say civility because, oh, excuse me, you guys, one sec. The symphony over here. All right. Let's <laughs> I think there are, there are still kind of opportunities to, to regulate discourse, but there has to be a significant amount of attention given to that that regulation not being content based. So I think in the Southboro case, what we learned was, um, you know, I think when I read that, I thought, oh, wow, that person has despicable behavior. And I would have told any chair um, that they could, you know, ask that person to stop talking and sit down. Um, but the difference, it seems, from that judge's perspective 
was that uh, the meeting was paused and then the chair was yelling at the individual. And so the judge got not only some sort of, you know, feeling about the official action, but then also saw, you know, that that content of that discussion was what was upsetting him. So, you know, again, I think some of the kind of uh, guardrails that we've used in the past to assist in, in running an orderly meeting have definitely moved. And for that reason, um, you know, I think people need to be more thoughtful as, as a committee, as, you know, as a, um, as a multiple member body about how those limits are gonna be imposed in a way that, that are content neutral. So, you know, what is content neutral? Everyone can speak for three minutes. Uh, what is content neutral? Nobody can speak again after they've spoken the first time on a particular topic. Um, it's content neutral to say we're going to have 30 minutes of discussion about, you know, 30 minutes of public input on matter X, Y, and Z. Um, and then cutting off that person, whoever's speaking at the 30 minute mark to say, hey, you know, we said 30 minutes, we're at 30 minutes, thank you for your thoughts, you know, please feel free to come again next week. Um, so those, those types of, of controls are appropriate, time, place, and manner. So how long someone can speak, when they can speak, and whether, um, you know, whether we have the ability to say, uh, you know, we're running this meeting under the open meeting law, which by the way, um, I'm sure, uh, people notice that the Southboro decision does not mention the, uh, the open meeting law at all, which um, many of us found to be perplexing because, in fact, uh, the open meeting law, you know, imbues the chair with some authority to run the meeting. But neither here nor there for this. Um, you know, again, I think this focus on what's disruptive behavior, not following the essentially the, the rules that will apply to everyone and understanding that uh, making exceptions to the rules. So, gee, you know, Joan is speaking longer than three minutes, but we really want to hear what she has to say. She's insightful on this. Let's extend the time versus, you know, John not liking what we have to say and being critical, et cetera. And we say, oh, your three minutes is up. You're done now. So those are, those are the, the types of things that people are going to have to watch out for as chairs. So Lauren, that sounds like I'm just thinking about that three minute example that you shared. It seems that whoever is chairing the meeting really does need to be consistent. So no matter how insightful or how ranting someone is, three minutes is three minutes. And, and that often feels problematic to chairs because they feel like they're doing something uh, discourteous. Yes. But I think the issue there for me is um, consistency. Um, and, you know, so then the public gets really used to that time limit. Um, um, absolutely, Pat. And I think, you know, I think that's the, the actual takeaway is that what we kind of see as facilitating an interesting and thoughtful dialogue um, is bound to lead to, uh, you know, decisions made based upon um, content. And, and position. Yeah, yeah. cuz we're much more likely to allow a person or to encourage a person who's calm and you know providing as i said insightful and thoughtful comments even if we don't agree with them um versus somebody who's really worked up and angry and um even if they have legitimate things to say you know we're kind of focused on that on that part of it. So yes, i think as a chair to say these are the rules for this meeting, and these are the rules that will apply throughout the meeting. We're going to have public input, you know, from this time to this time. Um, everybody can speak once. No one can speak for more than three minutes. And when time is up, it's up, and we're moving on. And it's not personal. I want to tell everyone right now, it's not about you. It's me. You know, we need to move on. I need to be consistent here. The other thing I was wondering, and then I want to open it to other counselors, but peaceable. <laughs> Mm -hmm. How do we define and should it be defined in our rules? Um, so it's really funny because when I read your um, kind of summary of questions, I was like, oh, these are all the these are all the points. These are all the things that are unsettled. Um, 
we don't really know what peaceable means. But again, I think making threats, kind of um, moving around the room in a way that's menacing, um, you know, essentially acting in a manner which would cause a reasonable person to be worried about their safety or the safety of others. But just being mad and gesticulating and saying obnoxious things is not the equivalent to being non-peaceable. Okay. Pat, before we move to the next question, can we just confirm that Michelle can hear and be heard? She joined a, a minute ago. Yeah, Michelle? Yes, my apologies. My computer is rebooting, so I'll be rejoining when that happens, uh, but I'm on my phone right now. Thank you. Are there questions from either Michelle or Mandy or Jennifer or Lynn? I'm not. Mandy? Yeah, I appreciate the peaceable question because that's um, um, a lot. So some of my other questions were, you know, I think in our current rules, we have residents of Amherst may get, get preference over non-residents. Mm -hmm. When we do stuff on Zoom, um, how do we how do we regulate? that in a manner that you don't recognize someone and then maybe cut them off after they've stated where they live and could you then cut them off after they've stated where they live based on the the rules so that's question number one number two regarding the civility issues can we still regulate sort of decorum for participants in meetings outside of the public comment period um, so amongst not just counselors themselves, but say amongst staff that are participating or other committees that have been invited into our meetings for, you know, discussions and all. So, or, or can we not regulate civility at all? <laughs> um, well, Mandy Joe, let's get to right to the heart of it, right? Let's not like uh, beat around the, the edges there. Um, all right. So in terms of what civility, what decorum issues can be regulated. Again, I think to the extent that it's dealing with uh, the conduct of the meeting only and the rules are the same to everyone, there's probably a level of regulation that can be applied. So for example, we're not gonna talk over each other. People aren't gonna talk until they're recognized by the chair. Um, when, uh, you know, when another person is, when you don't have the floor, you, you can't speak. Um, those are the types of things that have nothing to do with content. It has to do with time, place, and manner. So, um, you know, we've been working with a lot of moderators uh, during, because it's town meeting season, um, and a lot of what we've kind of focused on is to say, you know, I have a job here to run a meeting, and my job is for this meeting to run efficiently and effectively. And so I'm going to impose some rules that are intended to make that happen. And it doesn't matter what your position is or you know, how you approach this or you know, whether I agree with you or I don't, um, these are the rules that are gonna apply. And so, yes, I think you can regulate decorum as long as it's not directed at someone's, or, or it doesn't have the, the inadvertent uh, uh, you know, result of, of restricting the content, restricting them based on the content of what they're saying. So, you know, should you rush and change your rules right now and define peaceable and, and things like that? I don't think so. I don't think we know enough yet about how this is going to work. And I don't know, did you guys see the ACLU letter on this topic um, after Southborough? Is that a yes or a no? Yes, we saw it. No, we did. Okay, I'm going to send it along to you because thank you. Um, in some ways, you know, they're saying this really isn't changing the status quo very much. It's it's just making making clear that you can't essentially treat someone differently because of the content of their speech. That's always been the rule. It's just that decorum and content kind of you know uh, the the edges blur around those things. Um, so. Again, I think there is an ability to regulate decorum. It just has to be done in a neutral time, place, and content manner. Okay. Thank you. Time, place, and manner yeah. uh, restrictions. Yeah. Jennifer? M Mandy Joe, I'm sorry, I missed the, I, I know I only answered the second one. What was the first question again? The first one was about regulation of potentially 
who speaks based on where they live or some other or where they work or you know right now i think our rules say we give preference to residents of amherst um with a zoom meeting can you if when we ask them to state their name and where they live and they say hadley can a, a person then say well no you can't speak right now um or once you've recognized them can you even enforce that since on zoom you you don't have that list sort of that indicates residents yeah um i think that's that's another good question. I think, you know, it is kind of time, place, and manner like to say we're going to um we're going to allow uh residents to speak first. We have a limited time here. Um, you know, we we want to hear from everyone, but if there isn't time, um, you know, we'd encourage the non-residents to send an email or a call or contact us in some other way. I, I do think that again, back to kind of the, the efficiency of the meeting, what you're looking for is to conduct a meeting that's reasonably efficient and effective. Um, whether you want to kind of push an envelope and layer on other, other restrictions or other criteria, um, that's gonna be you know, something that we see being tested as we move forward. So I do think, that because you know town government is for the residents and voters of the town that there is an ability to say yeah we're going to give preference but as you're pointing out Mandy Joe it's not that easy when you're recognizing people on Zoom so um, you know it, it it may be that that's the that that's the I don't know whatever the aspirational goal but that you know if someone is recognized and there aren't a ton of their hands up um, that you know, the, the chair says something like, you know, this isn't an exception or, or we're going to go ahead here because we've already recognized that person. Um, but just remember the next time someone who's not a resident starts spewing unhappy and impolite uh, comments, you're going to have to let them speak to. So again, I think it's really thinking about how as a chair um, and, and as a committee, there's going to be uh, kind of a consistent approach to to all of these issues. So for example, if if you say um, there's no, you know, we're only going to take input during the public portion of the meeting, as you can see, it's on the agenda from nine to nine thirty. And after that, this is you know time for the for the board or the committee to um, discuss and deliberate. Well, I think that's fine. You don't have to recognize anyone after that time frame the the issue becomes that someone has something that they think is valuable and you can't let them provide that information and so i'd stress at that point there's other ways to be in touch with us you know our phone numbers are posted our emails are available call um if you'd like an appointment with the council or with gol or whatever it is um you know we'll be happy to address that at, at some point in the future but um you know we have a limited time to do this and we have business that we need to get to. So I think it's constantly bringing it back to what is your role as the chair? What is the meeting about? And um, understanding that kind of once you draw the line, that is the line and any veering from it could be uh, troublesome or you know, uh, potentially um, viewed as, as content-based. Okay. Jennifer and then Lynn. Um, so would you agree that like our policy that we have now for public comment, like is complies with the ruling in Southboro? It, it sounds like what Southboro is really saying is, we're well, not really, it's saying it several things, but if you're chairing a meeting and a public comment, let's say is insulting to someone on the council personally, you know, it's your instinct to maybe intervene and that you cannot, you, you mm -hmm. cannot do that. You have to bite your tongue. But that um, if we were like to keep our policy the way we have it, which is we don't have a limit, we limit to three minutes the comments, but we don't have a limit on the number of people who can speak, or you know, we don't say we limit it to 30 minutes. Um, that that you know we could keep that in place um, because it seems also in our rules that the presiding officer does have a lot of leeway 
they can limit comments to one minute, that they have a lot of leeway to decide in a particular meeting how they want to handle it. So yeah, so that's what I just want to ask. What we have now in place complies with Southboro. Um, and so we wouldn't have to change anything if we didn't choose to. Um, we do have civility in our uh, rules, so that has to change. Yeah. Um, so I would say that um, it's worth looking at your policy, but again, I think it may be too soon to kind of get a real feel for the way this is going to play out in, uh, you know, in in municipalities across the state. Um, and uh, to the extent that, yes, that you have something about civility, civility is clearly not a word that we're going to be using. So we can talk about efficiency of meetings. We can talk about time, place, and manner restrictions that have nothing to do with content. We can talk about orderly meetings. And by orderly, I mean, we're going to have this half hour for public comment. We're going to go on to you know conduct our meeting um, at the end of that 30 minutes. That's it. And we're moving forward. We can tell um, you know staff or um, persons that are are uh, attending the meeting that you know they can't just jump in if that's what we want to do, um, and we can certainly um, you know do things a little differently if we want to by saying you know we're going to do this thirty minutes here, but every four weeks we're going to do a public listening session or something of that nature to allow additional opportunities for people to provide public input, but not at a, at a um, meeting that's scheduled to undertake other business, something like that. Thank you. Or, or not do that. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> We're fighting about that. <laughs> um, oh, and, and Pat, oh, I didn't know. Um, I would just add one more thing, which is, um, you know, whenever there are, uh, and all of my open meeting law trainings that I've given, including the ones in Amherst, um, I basically say, try not, <laughs> Bless you. it's spring, thank goodness. <laughs> um, it, we, we say, try not to go back and forth with the public input because you're much more inclined to be defensive or angry or, um, you know, disturbed or, you know, quick. And, and I think, um, Jennifer, as you just said, like you, you kind of have that natural instinct to respond. And so by, by kind of having that internal rule, you know, gee, we're not going to respond here to the extent possible, there is a much higher likelihood that the discussion and the cutting off of people or the encouraging people to speak doesn't become content-based. And if you think about it, I mean, the council and, and every committee of the council, it's really there's there's a job to be done um and however the the chair the vice chair has put together that agenda is what that job is for that night so it you know although i i know it may feel funny to not um encourage everyone to kind of be as as involved as they might want to um there's a good non you know non content based reason for that and that does allow um you know it does allow the the committee to do its work uh without getting derailed by you know the topic of the day or the you know the the you know hot button issue yeah lynn can you hear me yes okay Hi, Lauren, and thank you, and thanks, committee members, for asking your question. Um, I just want to clarify, not because I'm looking for change, uh, but I want to clarify a couple things. First of all, public comment is not required by open meeting law. Is that correct? That is 100% correct. It is not required. The open meeting law does not guarantee any person the right to participate in the meeting. The only thing it does is it guarantee the person the right to be able to hear what's going on at the meeting. So correct. There's no open, there's no public speak period required by the open meeting law. But our Again, local charter has a has a requirement for public comment at regular meetings. Yes. Right. 
I, I just want to be clear about the table. And again, I'm not trying to cut off public comment. I know the Amherst Community is in the audience, and I do not want to be misinterpreted here. Um, Good second, luck. <laughs> There is nothing in the open meeting law that says we have to go only 30 minutes, we could go as long as we want, or we could shorten it if we want. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Your okay. charter imposes a very general requirement that there be a period at each meeting of public body, and it does not set limitations on how that period is regulated or conducted. Uh, there is one exception in the charter, and that's when we call a special meeting of the body. And at that point, we do not have to have public comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanted to be clear that there's a difference between regular town council meetings and special uh, town council meetings, even though at special town council meetings, you can have public comment, but according to our charter, you're not required. Okay, so, and the other thing you keep saying is, um, you know, not to speak again. And again, I don't know of anything in our rules at this time that says you may only speak once during public comment or once on a topic. Yeah, correct. And I'm not insinuating, and I guess I should watch my words as well. I'm not insinuating that there's a right way to handle this. Um, I'm just trying to kind of make make you all aware of the types of limitations that wouldn't be content based so that would be time place and manner I'm Lynn, Lynn, there is a rule that thank you the number you. of public comments it's one per person per comment period that's okay. in our rules thank you thank you because we just had a public comment period recently where at least two people spoke twice and so basically i could have applied the rule yes you could. Um, Okay, and then my final question, and I, I just want to mention to the rest of the of the committee that I have a hard stop at uh, not uh, 1020 um, because of another uh, issue I'm dealing with. So um, um, I just so I really get the issue of name calling. Okay, and we've had it happen in Amherst, um, and you know it's not been pleasant, but our way of dealing with it has been to just let it happen and not do anything. And that's what I'm hearing your advice is. Somebody wants to call somebody on the council or the whole council or whatever, some fairly uncomplimentary name that maybe we don't agree with, but the reality is we can't stop it. And it is best for us not to comment about it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think the issue that would be really helpful for me, and I noticed that uh, Northampton has done this, is to come up with a, an additional statement as we move into public comment that is reflective of what is our value versus our, legally what we can do or not do. Hmm. And I may be looking for some advice on that. Okay. Yep, I, I understand that that point. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. Mandy. Yeah, thank you. Um, one question about overall time limits. Um, you've mentioned that we can do that. Jennifer has said, but we don't have to, and I recognize that. My question is if our rules don't, or if at the beginning of a meeting we don't say 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, pick a number, right? If we don't say we're gonna stop this at an hour, say. And we have, can, I, I guess the question is, can we stop it before everyone who has raised their hand has spoken? If we don't have a limit in the rules or at the beginning of a meeting, is there a way to content neutrally, could a counselor make a motion after three hours of public comment say and say, you know, we really need to move on. I move to close public comment period. Or does that possibility have to be written into the rules somehow? Well, I think making a meeting by meeting call, if it's not in the rules um, and not announced at the beginning is, is a precarious place to draw a line because do we think it's more or less likely that we're going to say we've had enough of this and I mean it in the nicest ways, but 
you know, if the meeting is unpleasant versus if everybody's, you know, kind of uh, singing kumbaya. So my, my kind of arm's length advice and without reaching any value proposition is that it's better to have a rule um, in place so that the, the council and its many committees are insulated from a civil rights challenge. Um, and that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, and perhaps um, Jennifer, when I was saying like, maybe every one, you know, four weeks, you'll do something a little different. That would also be okay to say, you know, at, at these three meetings, you know, we're not gonna, we're gonna do a limited public comment of whatever it is, a half an hour, but at meeting four, we are gonna, um, you know, allow a full hour, something like that. So that we're able to demonstrate, it's not that we're not interested in what people have to say or that we don't wanna hear from them, it's really related to the business of, of the council and what, or, or its subcommittees and what has to be accomplished. Um, but there's still another way to access the council, whether it's that kind of extended period or email or requesting an agenda item, something like that. Oh, hi. Okay, so I was going to say something, but I'll let Athena go first and then I'll say. No, please go ahead. I was just waiting till members had a chance to ask questions and then okay. I had a couple additional questions. So I remember, um, I think it was actually before I was on the council that <clears throat> it was, um, there was a lot of public comment and, <clears throat> you know, public comment had been going on for a while. And then Lynn said, and I thought this really worked. She said, okay. Um, I'm going to, you know, she gave like maybe two or three minutes and said, anyone who wants to speak who hasn't spoken, and this was when we were no, still in COVID, so everybody was remote, no one was allowed in town hall. She said, she gave it like a two minute time frame and said, raise your hand, you know, get in the queue. This was like after an hour or more of public comment, and I will take everyone whose hands raised in the next two minutes, but not after that. And that seemed like a good way for dealing with that particular meeting, you know, instead of saying we're limiting it to 30 minutes or a half hour, we'll do something every four weeks that you could do it on a minute by minute basis. And that was very fair because everyone had fair warning and they were given enough time to raise their hand and then you couldn't raise your hand after that. Yeah. So that would I, be okay, right? I think in a vacuum, that's fine. I think the problem is, you know, again, what what's going into the judgment that this has been going on long enough? And what's going into the decision of saying, all right, now at this point, we're going to have to wrap things up. And so, you know, I, I do believe that there are, um, you know, there are implications for trying to be um, uh, courteous as a council to the people that want to participate. And Again, it's, you know, the, the person that's kind of autocratic about it that says, oh, we've reached the 30 minute mark, everyone stop talking, let's move on. They're much less likely to run into a content issue because they have a very particular, oops, sorry, they have a very particular, um, you know, set of rules that they're using versus, okay, we've been listening to this, you know, people praising X, Y, or Z for all this time. Um, and that's really nice, but we want to move on. Does anyone else want to speak? Well, that's one thing, but to say, you know, this has been going on too long. Uh, you know, we've heard from all the people here that we've been hearing the same thing from every person. Um, you know, unless anyone has something new to say and raises their hand in the next two minutes, we're done. So again, I think it it's more of, um, if you have one set of rules, it's easier to follow. And perhaps there is a good way to say, you know, will allow a vote of the council to extend the time or something like that. But again, are we more or less likely to extend the time based on what we're hearing than based on, you know, the business of the council? And some, in some ways, having the rule, even though it may seem less inviting to the public, is more protective of you know, the, the, the meetings business and of the, the body in general. So one could have maybe 
an hour public, you know, you could have in your rules a longer public comment so it doesn't feel like you're likely to be cutting people off before everyone's spoken. Certainly. Thank you. Athena? I just and had a couple, you, couple quick questions to add. So you talked about the time and manner of public comment, but we often, I think, even the the council and committee agendas include uh, public comment on matters within the council's jurisdiction or on matters within the committee's jurisdiction. Is that limiting the content of public comment in a way that's going to be problematic? So um, this is one of those things that the ACLU basically said they see that as an appropriate um, as an appropriate type of limitation. And so I think you know we have that kind of backup. Um, to, to rely on. So, you know, who's going to challenge these rules? Somebody who feels they were mistreated and, you know, somebody who can get the support of a, of a broader group. So if the ACLU is saying, hey, you can limit these kinds of discussions to, um, or this kind of input to what the council or committee has jurisdiction over, I think that's fair. And it's not limiting positive or negative comments. It's saying, we have a we have a, a job to do here. Um, the council only has so much authority, or the the committee, and so we're happy to hear from you on those matters. Now, that being the case, the tough part is to ensure that you don't make exceptions if you're the chair during those discussions. Because let's say someone uh, dogs. Um, <laughs> let's, let's say that someone um, that someone uh, you know says I'm really upset because my street hasn't been paved and I keep asking for it to be paved and the DPW won't call me back and I call the town manager's office and there's no response. The only thing there that could possibly be within the jurisdiction of the council is the quote unquote town manager's non-response. So you know, for you, for you to then kind of veer and have a whole discussion about how streets are prioritized and the program and this and that, that you all don't set, you can see that you're kind of opening a door to the next time someone wants to come up and talk about other things that are not squarely within the, the jurisdiction of the committee. So to, to repeat back to you what you said to make sure this is the case, if we allow one speaker to speak on a topic outside the jurisdiction of the town council at a meeting, the door is open for any other speaker at that meeting to right. talk about whatever they like. Is that the case? Yes, and likely at future meetings as well, because again- if, So we've set a precedent. Yes, yes. Okay. So if we think somebody's completely against something and we say, oh, you know, tonight isn't the night, we're not doing that today, now we've shut them down because of what we think they're going to say and not because of the rules that we have in place. Um, one more question. We do written public comment. There's a form that folks can fill out online that automatically distributes to council members and then we post it. Does this apply to written public comment? And, and if people submit written public comment on a, say, racist rant about a council member or something, can that be redacted or edited or anything? We have to post it just as it's been written. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is, that, that's the, that side of the coin. Um, if we're opening a door to, to public comment on anything, which kind of sounds like what you're talking about with the written public comment, um, then yeah, you wind up having to um, include mostly everything. Um, you do not, I mean, the, the court in Southborough didn't find it to be hate speech or fighting words for um, someone to call, uh, you know, for the, the speaker to call one of the council members a Nazi. And I only bring that up here because, you know, I think there's many of us who might say, well, that is fighting speech and that, that is hate speech. Um, but the court said, no, they're basically entitled to their opinion. And so I think it's, um, I think it's, it's more than likely that if you're accepting written public comment about anything, that that kind of thing goes up. However, it doesn't mean that we can't put a big disclaimer at the top of that posting 
cage, wherever we're putting that some that, those things, saying we neither endorse nor reject the comments that are um, provided here. These are solely the opinions of the public, and the the town takes no position whatsoever um, on on the content. Um, you know, and and we could go even further. We could say, uh, you know, to the extent that um, persons may be offended by you know the the rhetoric or the the tone or whatever you know we expressly you know expressly um disclose that we don't really have the authority you know and we can play with something like that but we don't have the authority to to judge this based on content and so it's here in its unvarnished um you know its unvarnished manner um and that way we're doing ourselves, you know, we're, we're protecting the town by saying, hey, just because this person made a racist rant here doesn't mean that that's the position of the town, but it also protects that individual's, you know, First Amendment right to share their positions. Thanks so much. I have, I have Jennifer, and then I'd like to add, and Jennifer, then Lynn, and then I'll ask a question. You're muted, Jennifer. I'm sorry, I took down my hand and didn't unmute. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, so we always say with public, I think it's always said before we start public comment that we're not going to be commenting. So if somebody were to say something that not, might not be the business of the council that night, although it doesn't have to be because you can comment about anything during general public comment, but even if someone were to veer and it's not, to say something that's not the councils within the council's uh, purview, because we don't respond, it seems like we don't, we probably don't want to have to limit that, let somebody say what they're gonna say for three minutes, you know, even if it's about potholes that may not relate be in the council's jurisdiction, um, because we're not, we've said that we're not gonna respond. So we're not gonna deviate and get into a whole discussion. Um, and then I'm just thinking maybe we could have something at the, you know, just a, maybe a sentence, you know, not, um, a long sort of preamble, but before we go into public comment, making the statement, I don't know how we would do it, that, w you know, uh, whatever somebody says, because it could be seen that if somebody were to say something really terrible and racist, that by not calling it out, we're condoning it. So some statement, you know, both for the public, um, the written record, but also before a council meeting or a committee meeting, why we're not going to rein someone in or mm -hmm. cut them off if they say something, you know, that would be generally considered offensive. Yeah, um, I, I think that makes sense. Um, I also think, you know, that part of that statement could be we encourage people to be respectful of one another, or we encourage civil discourse. Um, you know, the people who, um, you know, work in the government, whether as volunteers are doing so because they care about the community, just like the people who are going to speak care about the community. Um, and so you encourage it, um, but it doesn't mean that it could be shut down. So, um, but I do think you can limit, you know, and this goes back to um, the, the ACLU's kind of position. I think you can limit the comments to the jurisdiction of the council. I think you could limit the comments to what's on the agenda. Um, I don't think you can limit the comments to what's not on the agenda. So I don't think that you could say, you can't say anything about uh, what's on the agenda for the council to think about today, but you could say we're going to focus on, you know, what the council is talking about today if you have something about that, because again, that's a time, place, and manner thing that relates to the business of the meeting as compared to we don't want someone to go on a rant about something unrelated, you know, to, to this matter. So again, I think you could say we're going to limit comments to the business of the meeting um if that's what you wanted to do and and none of this is mandatory um you could have a free-for-all where you literally say nothing and you just wait it out um you know again i do think it's nice to have a disclosure and I, I think that's a really great point maybe at the beginning and at the end you know we've heard some interesting things here tonight just a reminder the town doesn't endorse or um, you know, or reject the statements made. These are solely the opinions of the public who chose to participate. Lynn? Thanks, Pat. Um, Lauren, is there anything 
in a published public comment that someone has submitted with a statement that's saying, as with our emails, frankly, uh, that this is now public record. Uh, is there anything that needs to be redacted, like a child's name, like a phone number, like a health issue? Mm -hmm. um, so in most cases, the exemptions to the public records law are not mandatory. Um, so I think there's two ways to handle it. One way to handle it is to say anything you send in will be a public record. And basically that's on you um, in a more polite way. Um, or, you know, we intend to publish, you know, your comments in full, provided, however, um, that if, uh, you know, if one of the exemptions to the, no, not that, provided, however, that in cases of extreme import, you know, we reserve the right to, um, to make redactions to protect minors and the elderly, um, you know, people in a um, susceptible population. Um, again, every time we put in a caveat, it makes it harder to enforce in a non-content based way. Right now we do have a, a note in when you enter an online public comment that um, your, your comments will be published as part of the record. Um, and there's a different field to enter your name as it as you wish it to appear and the home address and email address aren't published and those are all there's a consent button as well. So I think it's pretty clear that everything that's entered, but it's an interesting question if someone enters information about somebody else's child or something like that, um, that gets tricky to filter all those public comments before we post them. Yeah, I, I'm trying to make sure that we don't have to filter them because um, it's an extensive job and we only have 55% uh, of our clerk of the council. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to um, end, end the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, because this idea of precedent, we've been doing things for four years in a certain kind of way, which sets a precedent. How is it possible to make changes to that, whatever they are, you know, time, manner, place kinds of things, um, limiting, uh, public comment to what's on the agenda would be a change in precedent for us. What we do now is have general public comment, and then we ha often have additional specific periods of public comment. Um, so what can we change if it, if we've already established a precedent? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Pat. And I think that the answer to that is government is allowed to adapt and respond to new um, to new positions or to new cases or statutes or whatever it might be. And in fact, I think it's likely expected that in the face of kind of a, a um, you know, like a level shifting kind of decision like the Southboro case is that you take a look at what your current practice is and make adjustments to address, you know, potentially, you want to provide more time for public input. You want to formalize this, this system that you've been having with specific public input on the, the matters at hand and then this kind of open-ended part um, at the beginning. And so you, you have, I think, a legitimate public interest in taking a look at how it's working and how it could work um, and you know, also being cognizant of what's happening around the state um, you know, what are other communities doing? What are some ideas? And, and then adopting a new policy or an amended policy to address that. And we, we, see, we see this issue um, a lot of times with regard to use of what, you know, forum analysis, public forum versus limited public forum versus a private forum, where let's just say for years we've been allowing, you know, uh, nonprofits X, Y, and Z to utilize space in our, you know, whatever building. And, you know, we start getting requests for that space from, you know, a gazillion different groups and, you know, it's really hard to manage that kind of thing. We can, as a, as a policy making entity, decide we need to change that policy because 
that policy is creating, you know, um, implementation problems for for the town. And at that point, you know, we have to we have to explain. Well, why is that? Well, before just one group was using it. Now it's like we need a staff person to manage all of the reservations and the cleaning and all of that stuff. So that would be a legitimate public purpose to take a different position. So again, I think it's tying tying the changes to legitimate public purposes. Um, it's not, for example, to silence the members of the of the town, I mean the residents of the town. It's to ensure that you know we are able to do our business, you know, that that we have in our agenda and we want to go home before 1 a.m. And those are legitimate public okay. purposes. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this particular topic? Michelle, you've been pretty quiet. Do you have anything that you're thinking about? You've covered them all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if it's comfortable, then um, I'd like to look, uh, look at the flag policy issue, particularly um, around um, making decisions. You know, I think the policy is, is basically well designed. And some of the questions we had um, really had to do with. Uh, public initiatives, if, you know, if the public comes forward and they're, they have enough signatures according to our charter, they can um, force an issue, can they make us fly a flag? Um, and I'm not saying that well, so if somebody wants to say it, better, that's fine. The other thing is very specifically, we have, some people have concerns, some counselors have concerned about the fact that we fly the Tibetan flag because each year on the um, in Mar on March 10th on the uh, in Tibetan National Uprising Day, we have a ceremony and a proclamation and um, speakers, and we fly the Tibetan flag. So, but that came up for one of the counselors uh, in terms of the policy that we've uh, created so far. Um. So this is another just area of uncertainty and uh, <laughs> blurred lines. So we'll do what we can today to talk about it as though there are answers to these things. Um, <laughs> essentially, the, the version of the policy that you have um, is adopting what we have kind of come to some consensus on as being best practices that the, if, if, if the council says, our flags are for public use, for public purposes. The flags located here, there, and there are just, you know, any resident who wants to can file an application and provide us with a flag and we'll fly it for a limited time, you know, on flagpole X. Then we don't have the ability to um, choose between flags, right? We get a group that everybody thinks is terrific. They come in, they have a flag. We have a group that only some people think are terrific. They come in and have a flag. And that's exactly what happened in Boston, right? Mm -hmm. they've, been, they've been allowing their flagpole to be used by anyone who asked. And so unless and until the, the policy issue, the content of the flag became an issue, it just wasn't an issue. But then the, the policy did become an issue and they didn't wanna fly um, the flag from a group that they saw as, you know, I, I don't know what the right word is, confrontational or, um, distasteful. And so that's where they ran into trouble. And so what we've been suggesting is that that a, um, an intentional look at the way flagpoles are used is a very good thing to do at this point to say, you know, are we allowing our flagpoles to be used for any purpose by anyone if they just follow the application um, process? Or are we going to say that as a town, we're only comfortable flying the flags that the town believes reflects the town's position? And so that's the whole idea between government speech and free speech. So government speech is essentially, we're not required to put up you know, the banners of, of um, a group that we think does not, does not speak for the town. And the idea is, you know, this public forum issue. If, if we have a completely open public forum, then we've said anything can happen there, right? That's, that's not a regulated use. 
But we also could say, look, this is the flagpoles have a particular location and a particular um, solemnity about them. And so we want the flags that fly from there to be representative of what this community believes in, right? What this community is prioritizing. And as such, the council as a legislative you know, uh, entity can take a position. Yes, we wanna fly the flags for X, Y, and Z days because we believe that that's what this community stands for. And by making a proclamation and tying the flag raising to the proclamation, that's been essentially coded as government speech. That's speech that the government is saying reflects the government. Um, if, but again, if you, if you kind of, and this is, uh, I think in, in most of the policies that we've been seeing, there's like, there's an exception for sports teams and it's just there and it's in a lot of policies. Um, so essentially it's like, you know, if the Red Sox are in the World Series, then we as a government think that that's a, an okay thing to, to you know, promote. Um, Some of us. Well, I'm just saying, as a I'm teasing. majority vote, majority vote. Um, but anyhow, I, I think, you know, that's the, that's the same risk that we run into if it's not government speech. If it can be um, that a person comes in and files an application and then we're just, you know, putting up the flag that they request, that is not government speech. That is an open forum. So what we have been suggesting is that there be a tie to government speech, if there's going to be some flag that's put up. And so we've said um, in some places that a request can only come from a counselor, right? So a counselor may be lobbied by constituents to bring forward something for government speech, um, but it can't come directly from the constituents. And I would say, particularly with regard to your charter, um, the actual flying of a flag is an executive function. And so even if, uh, you know, the council voted, yes, you know, we, we believe this is government speech, you know, making the town fly the flag is a different thing um, because the council isn't going out there and loading the flag onto the flagpole and pulling up the, you know, pulling up the, the line to make it go up. So again, I, I think grounding this, grounding the use of a particular flagpole um, for, governmental speech is a way to ensure that it's not just um, you know an open forum for anyone to put their their flag up there regardless of the message. Instead, it's a message that the council in specific has approved as you know standing for its position or standing for the government's position. And it is a little confusing because like how is that not making choices based on content? Um, but there's an actual exception in the law for government speech, um, and it's not subject to, uh, you know, the, the free speech rights as we think about them. Thank you. Michelle? Um, so government speech comes with government timelines. <laughs> and so that was my question last week um, or last meeting is if there is something emergent that feels really urgent for us as a council to fly the flag today or tomorrow because there's you know something going on in the world or how do we then deal with the fact that we don't have a resolution or a proclamation or something we don't have a council meeting maybe on the agenda how do we deal with that potentially um um i don't know no i'm kidding um there there's no there's no real no real answer. Um, you know, I think if it's if it feels that important to fly the flag that's not the town's flag or the state's flag or the United States flag or the POW flag, then you need to have some sort of a process in place. And maybe that's um, you know to look at the types of things that might uh, cause the town council to want to fly a flag of some sort. Certainly. Um, the same is true with regard to making a statement, right? So if if the council feels strongly about something, then it wants to release a statement, unless someone's 
previously been authorized to speak on behalf of the entire council, any statements that are made are either statements of individual people who happen to be counselors, or if it's you know a statement that the town manager makes, then a statement you know of the town's position. But it's not the same thing as it being a statement from the council. Um, so you kind of run into that same problem. Uh, and you know if if something is percolating, like let's say Ukraine, I know a lot of people were really interested immediately in in supporting Ukraine. You know, two days isn't gonna the the forty eight hours isn't gonna um, uh, make a huge difference, although I understand that you know the town may want to make a statement before that. And then again, I would say, you know that would be up to the town manager. Um, about whether to make a statement of sorts or individual members of the council making clear that they're only speaking as individuals. Um, and that could happen right away. So, Pat, can I ask Lauren just a quick follow up? Just oh, so sure. I can understand. Absolutely. Lauren, when you said the 48 hours isn't you know that long to wait, do you mean, are you saying that because we could call a meeting? for example, a special meeting or something within 48 hours. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so if let's just say, let's go back to Ukraine again, because it's just a good example of the kind of thing that, um, you know, people wanted to weigh in on right away. Um, if, if the invasion of Ukraine, I mean, people would have likely been thinking about what was going on over there. We would have heard about it. So it would, it would be on people's minds. And so if, you know, there was a, um, kind of a, a an event that made it important to speak publicly, then the meeting could be posted, you know, for 48 hours from then, 48 weekday hours. And so, you know, that in itself makes a statement, I think, you know, we're going to have a meeting to talk about this. Um, and in the meantime, as I said, you know, individual members um, could represent themselves on the matter. Um, or the town manager could make a, a more general statement, but it, it's unusual for something to require an immediate response. Obviously, if there's like a national tragedy or something like that, um, then you know maybe it is an emergency that the council has has a meeting and makes a statement. Um, but most of the time, that forty eight weekday hours time frame will not negatively impact you know the town's kind of uh, responsibilities uh, to the public in my, in my view. Jennifer? Yeah, um, so right now, I think we discussed at the last meeting that um, the request uh, to fly a flag has to come before a counselor. So, mm -hmm. and that's ensuring that then it's government speech. Yes. Yeah, and the, um, so the, there That's the start. A, I'm sorry, Jennifer, to interrupt. That's the start of ensuring that it's government speech. Yes. Okay. And the there was a draft policy in our packet for this meeting, yeah. and that's something that you that KP Law has seen no. and like that. Yes. Yeah. yes, they've seen it. Yeah, it was written by uh, the director of the D Diversity, right. Equity, and Inclusion Department. Yeah, I have to say, until like the last meeting, I had no idea that a flag was an issue mm -hmm. <laughs> when it first came up. I was like, oh, who cares? But it, yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, um, and and it should also be part of the equation. You know, if you guys had, and I can't remember offhand, but I'm guessing that you do, you have like banners that you fly from light poles and stuff. That's another area to consider. Um, you know, in my town, for example, it's usually about um, you know, shop local and that kind of thing put up by the town. Um, but at some point, you know, during 2020, actually, um, you know, we, we kind of lobbied, we the parents of, of graduating seniors to have, you know, congratulations seniors go up on those polls. And that was a town use and they allowed it. Could they have said no to us? Of course. Could they have said no to a group that they didn't like or that they weren't comfortable with? probably, but now we would say there should be a policy, right? And that policy should say, you know, has the council taken this on and said this reflects the position of the government on this issue? Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Hi, Paul. <laughs> hi, Paul. Uh, yeah, uh, Mandy. 
Thank you. You bring up a good question with banners, but I actually have a different question, which is our charter has a, a, a it's not petition, it's, a, it's, a, it's called a group petition, I believe, that allows 150 residents to sign a petition to ask the council to do something and the council must act. It doesn't have to approve it or disapprove it. How does this policy relate to that if, you know, it says here the town council shall consider the display of a commemorative flag only if the request is made by a member of the town council. But I don't think our charter is specific as to could we exclude things from the group petition process under the charter like this policy seems to imply. Um, or can't we do that so that we have to change this policy to include that group petition process, which is different than the initiative, which I think excludes things like this um, yeah. in exclusion, but the group petition does not. Yes, I don't that's think. right. Thank you. Yeah, um, my my kind of take on that is that the group petition process is to um, allow a group of constituents to bring forward to the council things that it thinks are important, right? Um, and that the council is not dealing with or they don't like it, but as soon as it's in front of the council, it's the council's decision as to how to handle it. And so, you know, if the council is hearing from, you know, 150 people who are willing to sign their name to it, and then as well, you know, people come to a meeting and flood, you know, flood the meeting, um, then maybe it's something that a counselor decides to sponsor. Um, it, again, acting on it takes different kinds of forms, right? So, acting is listening, acting is, you know, um, whether it's to, to decide to take no action or to affirm or reject or whatever it might be, but action would also be a counselor deciding to, to sponsor, um, you know, a request for a, a finding on, on a flag or on a cause represented by a flag. I think you have to read them together, Mandy Jo, and um, I would say that because you know, the charter is going to um, supersede inconsistent policies. So I think because the charter has kind of the supreme uh, position in terms of, of its application. So I would say um, we'd have to read the two of them together. And I think we can in a way that's, you know, holistically reasonable and appropriate. Paul, you've just, uh, Mandy, go, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to come back to the banner question. Um, does this, you know, I've read this policy as pertaining to our two main flagpoles on the town common were the keeper of the public way that includes the town common, but it also includes the public way portions where we do do banners or banners across the public way or those welcome to Amherst things on light poles. Um, does this policy and I guess the question is, is this policy written such that now those banners, the town council has not had any historically any thing to do with that. I think we might have even in the public way passed that on to the manager. Mm -hmm. um, so does this policy then bring that back to the council or should this policy mention that sort of passage of those things onto the town manager for the manager to adopt their own thing? I'm just trying to figure out how how we deal with those types of. Yep flags other than the two on the common that we tend to deal with. Yeah, so um, the policy in particular references the flagpoles to which it applies. And so, you know, we are talking about the two main flagpoles uh, on the common, and we're talking about the use of those flagpoles for purposes other than, um, you know, the United States flag, the town flag, the, the state flag, uh, and the prisoner of war flag. The banners are something different in that you have de designated or delegated the town uh, manager to deal with those. And there's a, a different reason, right? Because those banners are essentially um, being used to, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but to showcase the town in a particular way um, and for other purposes. So it is not something where a request you know, in general is made to use them, except maybe in specific, you know, particular circumstances. So um, the request would come in as a matter of, you know, business basically to the town manager's office and the town manager would need to be thoughtful about, um, are we opening this up 
and Paul's always thoughtful, um, but are we opening this up to, you know, to, to um, resident input or are we doing this based on essentially what we think these, these um, flags are supposed to be or banners are supposed to be uh, telling the, the people of Amherst. So for example, like welcome to Amherst, I, I think, you know, that, that there's no, the, the manager doesn't need a request for that to happen. Um, you know, welcome back students or, um, you know, whatever, I forget what your holiday, your, your pumpkin holiday thing is, but like, those are things that they are town speech, government speech. I mean, basically you're advocating um, for participation in town, in town issues. So again, I think that's different than putting a, a, a flag of another um, entity up in an official location that signals the the town approves of that particular cause. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, you know, I immediately go to the worst thing. What if a group comes forward and says, uh, "Town Manager Paul, I know you're very thoughtful, and we want you to put up an anti-abortion banner because Amherst needs to become a, a community that denies women their rights." Well, he's going to say no. Are we protected? Well, um, he's going to say no because he doesn't allow those banners to be used to advance the point of view of private positions. Instead, it's the positions of the town. And so, you know, could we kind of tie up the ends of that in a bow by having, you know, Paul uh, issue a policy about the use of banners or about the use of signs are about the yes we can um but i also think that that the you know the if a court were to review that they're going to look at past practice have we allowed these these banners or these signs to be used to further positions that are not the government's position or have we only used these for governmental purposes and if it's only been for governmental purposes we would say that's not a public forum. It's never been treated like a public forum and we have no obligation to allow those, um, those you know, sign areas or banners or whatever to be used for, for purposes other than the town's purposes. Thank you. Mandy? So I guess my question to Paul is for the banner that runs across um, South Pleasant Street, um, are you going to, adopt a similar policy since we've given you the authority to uh, regulate that one because we have in the past used it for um, advertising events on the common that are not necessarily town sponsored events and all sorts of things. It's been used for a lot more than just government purposes, I would say. So are, you know, or does this policy that we're adopting have to include whatever we've also authorized you to do with other flags on the on the public way. So I think you know Lauren is right. The the policy was written specifically for the two flagpoles that we are that are most obvious. Um, it does raise and we do have the Chamber of Commerce manages those banners. You know like that currently say Mary Mary and Bright. It's still Christmas I guess at the chamber. Um, the and also we put flags up the American flags like this. This was a select board initiative prompted by Larry Kelly, I think from Flag Day to the July to Fourth of July, something like that. And I think on other Memorial Days they get put on light poles. Um, and then the the banner across is just reserved through the DPW. I don't think they look at content necessarily. Um, it's just a reservation system. Uh, but it has had political content in the past. I, you know, there's a picture of you know, Black Lives Matter type thing. So I think that is something, you know, once I see how you sort of settle on your policy, we probably apply the exact same standards to that, that it would be for events. Uh, people can reserve it. They have to pay the cost of putting it up and taking it down and they have to provide the banner. Um, but I think we'd have to sort of apply some standards to what what we can say yes to on that. Right, so if we decide, because flying Black Lives Matter, that flying that banner is really important um, at, to me as a counselor, would we need then to have a resolution or a counselor input to, to do that? That might be the way to do something that's not an event to, to prompt it, to allow that, something like that. To I think, I guess, Lauren, I missed the beginning, so I apologize, but 
Is it a council action that 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 triggers the governmental speech? Um, typically, it is. Um, but the other part of it is, you know, what the history is of how that space has been used. And so, for example, putting up uh, American flags, you know, during uh, Memorial Day to whatever date it is, you know, that that's government speech, right? That that is clearly the town saying, you know, we're supportive of this particular um, this particular thing. In terms of if you allowed flags to go up at any time and you didn't you didn't regulate that at all, then you'd have a hard time saying, oh no, you can't put up your, you know, fill in the blank flag. So I think in terms of of uses, what's important to consider is are there, you know, are you able to kind of categorize what these different these different um, actions or what these different displays are intended for. Um, I think saying, you know, come to the whatever on the town common, um, you know, that might be one thing, but saying, uh, you know, taking a position that advances a particular, you know, um, policy or um, my, or, you know, thought process or whatever may be something different. And so, Paul, I would say it's something that certainly we can talk about and and you can analyze you know how those things are used and what the rules are but again i think you know adopting kind of some guidelines protects the town's ability to to say no when it when it really feels that it has to because it's inconsistent with the town's position um so that's something we can work on um i did not mean to open a can of worms on that so sorry sorry no no but it's important <laughs> it it's is important. Are there any other questions uh, right now for Lauren or for Paul? Well, and with that, I'm going to say, Lauren, thank you very much. Uh, it's been very productive. Uh, now we have lots of wrestling to do with each other, which is always fun. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And just as I said earlier, and I think it's really important to kind of focus on that there aren't easy fixes to this. And so like just kind of changing the policy today on X, Y, or Z thing isn't necessarily um, the ideal approach because yeah. we, as you can see, I mean, basically all of the things we've talked about, we've said, gosh, there's a line, but we don't know exactly where it is and it blends. And, you know, maybe this is a governmental speech issue or maybe this is a public forum issue. And so I think thinking about it in this new context is really valuable and, um, you know, you guys always do the hard work, so I know that you're not in a rush, um, but uh, I think this is something to be, you know, intentionally thoughtful about in terms of making big changes. Yeah, and if any other questions arise for us, uh, I'll send them to you via Paul. Certainly. Okay. Thank you right. very much. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me, and there's really nothing I like better than talking about this stuff for you know, an hour or two. Come so. anytime. Thank you. Just don't charge us. <laughs> well, I, I will be reasonable. Okay. I will be reasonable. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good uh, have a good rest of your day and week. And hopefully I'll talk to you all soon. Take care. Thank you, Lauren. Bye-bye. Thank you. That was a very a very valuable conversation. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um uh Paul, do you have anything that you're going to hang around you're welcome yeah. to. if you want me if you if you have something for me otherwise i'll move on whatever you prefer well I'm, i i feel like we have a lot of stuff um to think about and to process individually and as a group so uh unless there are something that any of you want to share right now after this conversation i'd like to bring it up again at our next meeting does that feel comfortable um then um we, I think we have, you know, we have the Amherst Indy in the audience. So um, I don't know whether we need to call for public comment, but even with, okay. So I would like to take just a, a few mo moments then and to ask the Indy or anyone who hops on in the next couple of minutes of whether they would like to make public comment. And if you do, please raise your hand. Michelle, your hand is raised. 
for public comment. No, it's not. I just had a quick question. Last week, Athena had mentioned that we're not supposed to say who is in the audience, um, potentially. And I myself, as the chair of HRA, was curious about that. Um, is that what it, what's the feeling on that? Um, I can I can answer that. I don't think we should have a discussion about it today. Um, as long as the public comment period is closed, Pat. Okay, and it looks like the public comment is closed because we have no hand raised. So when questions like this arise, I often think of what we do at an in-person meeting. And you can't look around the room at an in-person meeting and go, I can see so and so and so and so and so and so because um you don't know everyone's names. And so what um when that issue comes up, it's I think it would be inappropriate to say the names of every person. Uh, it's an open meeting. People don't have to disclose their names. They do have to type in something when they join on Zoom, but that may or may not be their name. So there's no requirement that people identify themselves when they come to an open meeting. Anyone can come in and out. And um, so in my opinion, the body shouldn't, that shouldn't be a practice to name the people unless they've raised their hand for a public comment. Anything else, Michelle, on that? No, it just that was a helpful okay. clarification. Thank you. I think what I'd like to do is um, I haven't heard anything from anybody about Art Week, so we're going to take that off the agenda. The uh, updated Memorial Day, the 2023 Memorial Day proclamation has was in the packet, and uh, I we can look at that and um, decide whether it's clear, consistent, and actionable. There are two, I'll call you in a second, Mandy. There are two new sponsors to that. Uh, and besides Lynn Griesmer, Pam Rooney, and Dorothy Pam have been have asked to um, be added. Yes, Mandy. Yeah, there is one change, and this just goes to, again, what the role of a sponsor is versus not. Um, the item that was in the packet did not have the correct Memorial Day date in the now therefore it had last year's um and i feel like that's something that should come to us with the correct date <laughs> um if the sponsors are going to do stuff that we as a gol should not have to be looking up the correct dates um which is may 29th 2023 this year but it came with may 30th 2022 okay thank you so that would be changed uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. I want to, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just, we've got, a, I got an email from the veterans director uh, this morning confirming that the Memorial Day uh, celebrate or commemoration and the parade will be on Monday, May 29th with the parade kicking off at 9.30 to 10. They haven't put the program together, but it will be on Monday, you know, um, the actual so Memorial be... Day. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Athena, can you make that change? Uh, where would you like me to make a change? Should we have that information in the proclamation, I guess? I, I think we send that information back to the sponsors and ask them if they want to put it in before it comes back to GOL. Oh, that's true, because we don't have any of them here. OK, and we have plenty of time, so let, that's what we will do. And Pat, I'm sorry, who, who did you mention were the other sponsors? Uh, Dorothy Pam and Pam Rooney. Okay, thanks. Okay. And and Athena, can I ask you to forward that back to the sponsors or is that something I should do? I can do it. I'll send it to you and you can ask the sponsors if they want to make changes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let me see where... Public comment. Uh, I'd like to then go to the adoption of the minutes from March 15th and March 29th and get those out of the way. Jennifer? Yeah, I didn't see those in the packet or were they in a previous packet? No, they weren't. They were they, I thought they were, I thought they had been added to the packet because I looked, I started to look at them this morning. They, they were put in. They should be in there. Yeah. Really, I'm, let me see, maybe I have to refresh. Okay, I guess I'm. I'm 
Yeah, they're in SharePoint. They were in there this morning in yeah. SharePoint. Um, yeah, I, I was looking at the public packet. Yeah, I'm looking oh. now. No, I, I may have moved that. Yep. I moved it. Turn on the public packet. I'm sorry about that. While we're struggling with that, Paul, can you send me the update from the veterans about when and where just in an email so I can get that to the sponsors as well? Yes. Thank you. So do we want to go forward with Approving the minutes. I can make a motion. Yeah, I, know. Oh. I read through them, so I didn't see anything. I move to adopt the minutes of March 15th and March. Well, I move to adopt the March 15, 2023 and March 29, 2023 meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, um, So we'll do a vote, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer. I, yeah, so no, my um, mistake. I just looked in the public packet. So should I abstain if I haven't seen them? No, it's up, you, it's up to you if you want to yeah. abstain. Or yeah. 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 Oh, okay. yeah, one of the things I learned early on is you don't have to be at the meeting to approve the minutes. Uh, you just, you, you're not going to make any kind of change or amendment because you weren't there, but you can certainly approve them. But yeah, I didn't even read them, yeah. so I think I'll that's approve. Yeah, that's fine. Michelle? Aye. Mandy? Aye. And I'm an aye, so the, uh, they are approved. And let me see. Um, we have a half hour, basically. And we can start looking at some of the rules and procedures. Um, or, <laughs> and I wouldn't mind this because of what, I, what I'm dealing with this morning. Uh, I wouldn't mind ending the meeting early. But I did want to get, if we do that, I do want to say that I have been working on the bylaws that were forwarded by the Bylaw Review Committee, and I'll be getting that uh, to you at our next meeting. And uh, I need to get some information from Paul, and I've been comparing current bylaws with the former bylaw to see if they've been updated. So uh, I don't know. So where would people like to go? And I think, I think, yes, Mandy. So I think the way the agenda is written, we probably should not talk about the rules of procedures just because it's not very clear on the agenda that that's what we would be doing today. Um, oh, did I not? Unless I missed it. You had the discussion regarding the impact on our public comment policies, but not the rules on in right, general. right. So yes, so that would have been the us reflecting on what we just heard, yeah. Uh, in terms of, um, so I, I'm always happy to end a meeting early. I think I would really like to do <laughs> that <laughs> so that I can stop Twist worrying about whether I can even sit here. <laughs> All right, if, if okay. um, so I see, I, M Michelle, is it all right with you if we end early? All right, yeah, I think it'll be fine with Erica and uh, Paul. Thank you all very much. So Okay, really take it easy. Good. Yeah, Good see you later. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. And Athena, if you could send me the link when you have a moment. Thank you very much.